I get a class of fourth graders, and I roll them for three years. Um, they um, go from fourth to fifth to sixth with me. And as you can see, 90% of my students, actually more than 90%, are second language learners. Um, they're um, um, at risk uh, because they qualify for free lunch, so they're students of poverty. Um, um, and, um, well, we'll just... So uh, the second day of school this year, I took a survey with them to kind of find out where they stood. And here's what we found out. What city do you live in? Um, nine students had the correct answer. And you might think, well, these are students of poverty. They're transient. They move around a lot. Um, and that's true. But over 50% of my students have been at our school since kindergarten or first grade. And only two or three had really ever lived out of our area. So that's not really the issue here. Um, what state do you live in? When up to half the kids knew that. What country do you live in? And it gets pretty ugly. Only three kids can name what country they live in. What's your address? Seven kids knew their address. What's your home phone number? Only four knew it. Seven didn't have a landline home phone. So what, why such a disconnect for these kids? You know, we talk about a narrowed curriculum a lot, and we talk about how um, we don't want to have a narrowed curriculum for these students. But these students have really had a narrowed curriculum since the time they were born. They haven't had the experiences and the inputs to build the schema for the world. Um, and it, it's hard to be able to imagine what could be if you don't know anything about what is. And if it's hard to imagine, where does your creativity spark from? And if you don't have um, a lot of imagination and creativity, where do you build passion from? So um, here's my class two years ago. My last class is sixth graders, and we rolled to this one. So you can kind of see I have a class of one-to-one -one laptops. I have an interactive whiteboard. Um, we have several digital cameras. All my students have their own blogs. So that allows us to, you know, when we're not test prepping, to think out of the box a little bit. And so um, here's what that can look like. This is a project. That photograph was taken a month ago yesterday. So this is something we just did. We sent a, a balloon up over uh, 100,000 feet. Um, the college professors from UNR, um, there that helped us. So we started out, you know, we used the science book a little bit, and it had this nice chart in it that showed the layers of the, the atmosphere, which is one of the standards we were supposed to hit. Um, and, um, you know, so we did some reading. Um, we did some, some activities like this. And, man, the kids got, get fired up. I mean, you know, when they see this, they can't really crush because that air pressure change. You know, they, they really do get fired up to the point that they really get fired up. <laughs> and, and then they, they see the whole hot air balloon piece. Um, and then once we've done this, we've seen the chart, we've done some reading, we've done a couple of cool activities, then we, um, I, I make up a 25 question multiple choice test that's tied into our state science. No, that's not what we do. Because remember I said my class blogs. And so what we really do is we have all the students embed the videos they made um, into their each individual blog, and then they have to write about what happened. You know, what did we actually do, and what was the science about? Why did the can crush? Why did the, the tissue paper rise in the air? Um, and by the way, if you, I didn't point it out, but um, one of those blog posts had already been read 141 times, and the other one 73 times. Then we went into a history of ballooning. And it was interesting, about the time we got to talk about zeppelins, we found out that the balloon they were going to send up, they were going to use hydrogen instead of helium. And that had all kinds of implications for the kids. We put together a, a wiki web page where the kids got, got to start. We use wikis a lot in class, but the kids hadn't learned to uh, make them themselves. So each group in my class and another fourth grade got a different topic that we were studying and started to put together their own wiki page. We have our own um, class Flickr account. So um, these are actually some of the pictures that the camera my class had in their um, payload um, got back. I wish I could tell you stories about some of the pictures. So we have a Flickr account because we do this kind of work. Um, the students had to write stories where they were the balloon taking the trip. And they told about the whole trip from beginning to end from the point of view of the balloon. Um, and so we studied video clips and, and, and talked about all the different things that would happen. They already knew that the higher you go, pretty much the colder it gets. So, you know, th they start off with their in the box. 
And what's that like? And then the box is opening and there's maybe, you know, a little light coming in and then being pulled out. And then the next thing that happens is they insert a, a tube and they start filling me up with gas. And, and that's when you really um, enjoy teaching fourth grade because it's one of those times you have to stop class and, and explain to the kids again that, um, no, remember, you're the balloon. You're not a person in this story, so that's not your butt, okay? And so any time that there's a possibility of explosions and you're using the word butt in class and nobody's getting in trouble, it just doesn't get too much better for fourth graders. I mean, the attention span curve just goes like this, and you've got them for at least the next 20 minutes. So we used free online software to design their, their book covers, and they illustrated all these stories with their photos from Flickr. And then we turned around and went, well, you know, let's put them on our blogs, too. So they, they cut and pasted their, their stories into their blogs, and then they just went and found the embed code for the pictures. And some of them have 15, 20, 30 illustrations for their stories. Um, and you can see, you know, read 71, read this one so far. And so the kids see, hey, people are really reading my stuff. I mean, I'm published. <clears throat> um, we decided to tie into this whole idea of um, um, setting goals for yourself. So all the students, after we brainstormed it, had to write a high hope for their school, for their community, and for the world. And so they posted those on their blogs. And then using another free online software um, that's supposed to, to make a trading card, we made what we called strato cards because they're going to go to the stratosphere. And so they, we took pictures of them. They put their, um, and they did all this, they, they put their text in there. And then after the balloon came down and we had pictures, they each picked a picture and made it the same size and we tacked that on the back. This little blemish here is a little hunk of the balloon they got to glue on there. And then we laminated them and they got to take those home. I mean, they were pumped. <clears throat> well, then this, you know, when you've got kids that are building a learning network because they're blogging and Skyping with kids all over the world, and they start getting comments like this, before we sent up the balloon, after they posted these, these things about their high hopes, um, they started getting comments like this, and they said, wow, why don't we let everybody send up their high hopes? So on our blog, <clears throat> we, um, we, we put up this quick um, 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 plea for, you know, send us your high hopes. And then we leveraged that Web 2.0 thing, and, and the kids went out and started leaving comments on all the blogs we kind of typically blog with, and then would look on those blogs, um, lists of, of the people they blog with, and would go to people they've never blogged with and leave comments. And you know what happened? The, I mean, they just started coming in. Um, Thailand, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Um, think about what was happening in Bangkok, Thailand five weeks ago. Do you remember? Because look at some of the comments that came from Thailand. Um, our high hope is that peace and normality will return to our city soon. Um, I didn't know this was happening. I didn't see this in the news. Maybe you did. My high hope for the world is people will stop abandoning their pets and leaving them to die on the streets as they try to survive. I mean, that was pretty poignant stuff. And so after they'd all come in, we burned them on a CD, and you can see the strato cards back here, and sent the world's high hopes up with ours. Um, we had some face-to-face, -face too. Travis Fields, who's a, a University of Nevada grad student, came in and talked to the kids about some of the engineering stuff he does. I mean, do you know they actually get to design and build cards in that class? And that's what they do. Uh, and then we, you know, built our payload. The, every single kid had a part in, in um, making each layer of our, um, of our payload. So there's, that's not the actual camera we use. There's the strato cards, layer, layer, layer. We put that in a recycled grocery bag, put our pictures. There's the other two payloads from the other two fourth grades. And here we go. I mean, is this cool or what? And let's look at it from the balloon's point of view. Now, if you've got Dramamine, this is going to be the good time to take it right now. Notice how long you can hear the kids. And if you listen, you can hear the sleet that was falling that day hit the bag. Okay, hold on, whoa. And then we get up to about 80,000 feet and it's just quiet because there's so few air molecules, there's not much sound. That's Pyramid Lake, uh, northeast of uh, Reno, Nevada. And so the balloon keeps going up and of course the air pressure keeps going down and so the balloon is expanding and then it gets about 50 feet wide and that happens. Let's see it in slow motion. And so remember, the kids were writing those stories, so we looked at this, and they had to imagine that was them. 
And this is post-burst chaos. You know, oh my gosh, am I going, oh, right, this is cool, whoa. Or, you know, my, oh. And the parachute's trying to open. And, and so, you know, they had all the schema building to go into their stories. Um, and I, I really want to thank Doctors Lacombe and, and Wang, I mean, they were incredible with our kids and, and Travis coming in and, and working with them. But it wasn't over because after the balloon went out of sight, we went back in our room and because they had a radio sound on it, um, we pulled up a Google map and about every minute, a new red dot would appear on the screen. And then ironically, if you clicked on the red dot, a balloon opened up and told you how fast the, the balloon was going and what the altitude was. So we're watching this happen in real time. We came back, the kids opened their laptops. They had been instructed before we went out to um, just come in and write about what you saw, what, what, what they did, what you did. A lot of the kids had cameras, they were taking pictures and then they were supposed to swap them off every few minutes and, and then watch this. And, and one of the UNR profs came in and answered some of their questions. Um, and, and, and there it goes. And, and you can see it go over the lake. Um, but then it didn't stop after the balloon landed because Again, we're in a learning network. We're tied into all these other students, and we started getting messages from them that we want our teacher to do the can crush thing in the pay, but that she doesn't know how to do it. Well, problem solved. So one day um, um, in the afternoon, we Skyped in Alani King's class in, in Nelson, New Zealand, and, and it was Thursday for them. Um, so they were talking to us from our future. And so, um, <laughs> and so we did this for them, and my kids then, they had articulated this in writing, but when you're dealing with second language learners, articulating it in, in speech is a whole different animal. So we practiced a little bit and they got a chance to do that. And, and by doing that, they're reviewing the material and most importantly, they got to shine. Um, they, they got to show off what they knew and, and the other kids would applaud when, when we got done to fix. And do you notice how language intense this all was? The reading and writing to learn the content, the writing to clarify their thinking and to share what they've learned, the writing to tell a creative story, um, the feedback they're getting from me as they're doing a lot of this stuff, from each other in class, but then from all their peers in their network that are feeding them information. Um, they learn to connect globally. Um, they become more aware globally. Remember the kids that didn't know what city they lived in? And do you notice authentic audience anywhere in this? Okay. Um, and then, you know, we did the science stuff too. Um, so, you know, these kids did that. Remember them? I mean, they were able to pull all those things together. Now, I only wish I could talk to you about a lot of the other projects my students have done. This is Grace Corrigan, the mother of Chris McCall. She visited our class once three years ago, and we Skyped that out. So notice this is active learning. This is empowering students to become learners. You know, we've, we've really taught kids for a long time now how to be taught. How do, you, how, do you, how do you become someone that gets taught? You sit quietly and raise your hand if you have a question. But not now, because you ask me later, I'm busy. And so now we're empowering kids to want to learn on their own, to use a lot of these 21st century tools, most of which that are free, um, to do that. They're connecting themselves to the world, kids that haven't had a connection to the world or even their neighborhood. They're learning to collaborate within the room, but also outside of it. One of the projects I just went by was one where they wrote stories um, with, with kids in New York, collaborative stories. Do you think this is motivating? And so I had to share tonight a piece that's probably the greatest thing I've ever been associated with in my almost 30 years of teaching. Um, we um, were informed one day that um, we were going to receive a new student in our class, but don't worry, you're probably never going to see her. Well, yeah, she has leukemia and she's undergoing chemo and so her immune system's shot and so she can't come to school because that would make her sick. But we have to register her in a classroom and then she qualifies for home studies. Well, no, I don't think that's what we're going to do. <laughs> this is what we're going to do. We thought we would show how we start a typical afternoon in a fourth grade classroom. Oh, hi Celeste, how are you doing? All right, okay everybody, let's get to work. Uh, hey, you guys are all supposed to be typing your stories. What's going on? Let's get to work here. Oh my gosh. Uh, oh, Celeste, not you too. Sorry, Mr. Gummy. All right, let's all get to work. 
Now we are including Celeste as part of a regular day in school. I mean, not only are they learning, we're learning to change each other's lives. I mean, you know, how much better does it get than that? Um, we can't just keep racing kids through school. It can't be a race. We have to, 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 to keep making sure that we're um, giving them opportunities to um, build schema for the world. I wanted to end tonight with a quote from a high school teacher in Palo Alto, California. Um, and and um, I just think this strikes so much with the presentation here and what Keith was saying earlier. Um, David Cohen um, says, what I wish people would realize is that good schools with high test scores don't think of their instruction as some kind of a reward for the test scores. They don't focus on basic skills and then suddenly reach a point where, okay, now we have time to develop deeper knowledge, enrich learning, engage students' interests. It's not basics and then enrichment. The basics can be addressed more co covertly. The basics can be addressed more authentically. The basics can be addressed more effectively when those skills are developed in a meaningful and motivational context. Did we see a motivational context in a meaningful context here? He goes on to say, that type of environment shouldn't be the exception, the unearned privilege of the children of privileged parents and those lucky enough to attend a school with high test scores. That type of education is the birthright of every child. How many people believe that's true? So my challenge to you tonight is, um, you know, whitehouse.gov, ed.gov. They're asking right now, I mean, they're about to spend this big pile of money on our schools. Um, and they're deciding, not that first slide you saw, but something more in that direction than what I just showed tonight. So, you know, some of you have laptops there in the back. Okay, so are you already going? Whitehouse.gov, ed.gov. They've got a form thing there you can fill out and tell them what you think. Because we have to go back to a notion of, of, of building schools that honor kids and, and make this happen for everyone. Thank you.